what I'm interested in a lot and have been since I've started uh, examining and exploring in Second Life is this idea of using the um, platform for uh, exploration and immersive uh, tasks uh, such as quests which are if you like simple games um, so uh, there are a lot of games that you can find in Second Life I think um, but um, rather than the board games or the um, other types of games I think um, that involve contestants etc quiz games etc what I'm interested in is the kind of role playing games or, or quests if you like are called and that's what we've done at the uh, British Council Isle we set up a, a number of different quests which I think looking back now they're, they're quite simple um, and there are some other ones now that are uh, much um, more interesting um, so The, if you all have a look at that quest note card, can you see that? Um, by clicking on the book cover, you'll get the first note card, and then the bottom of that is the quest note card. Um, on the quests note card, this is something I've sort of kept up to date um, over the last four years or whatever. Um, as you go down, you'll see that it gets to uh, a number of details about different uh, quests. One of them I've just come across, is, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen it, is the Fungus Snail Trail quest, which looks quite, uh, quite interesting. And these aren't quests that are at all designed for language learning, but they're certainly quests I think that you can actually use for language learning. Um, unfortunately, as you, as you move a bit further down, you've got the Dark Dharma Haunted Manor, the Pot Healer Adventure, which was one of the first quests, and then Virtual Morocco, which is more of a sort of, um, uh, it was a student project to replicate uh, part of Morocco, but does have a quest uh, as part of it. And then we've got uh, links to a few that unfortunately have uh, now disappeared. Thursday's fiction was a great influence on the stuff that we did at the British Council. Um, it uh, was particularly interesting the way that they used text, um, but that's now gone from Second Life. Uh, Sentinel was a, a quest by IBM which was designed to encourage people to get interested in coding and that's gone as well. However, what I have found is that on the Second Life webpage under destinations and then adventure there are others um, which I haven't had time to explore yet but I'm going to do so okay um, so that's quest and second life I think uh, one of the things that is uh, intriguing about quest I think it's a very easy way to get um, something set up for language learners um, and you can do it from a very, very simple text-only way, giving out note cards, hiding, hiding um, uh, particular objects which give out note cards, or you can add text to parcels, etc. And um, I think anyone can do it. You just need the, uh, the permissions on the land to do so. Uh, to something far more complicated, uh, like the game that Christopher Flo uh, set up for his uh, students. And I put a little dedication on this note card to Christopher Flo, Christopher Surridge in real life. Because um, I think um, he, Hiker told me that uh, the news uh, earlier in the week that he'd actually passed away earlier this year. Um, but he has a foundation which is uh, continuing with his work and I think some of the stuff that he did in Second Life the Devil Island Mystery Project for example was uh, particularly innovative and um, very interesting I think and has influenced a lot of people 
Okay. Um, so that's gaming and second life. As I said, I'm just going to give a brief outline of um, of where I think games are uh, in second life and outside, and then uh, see what other people have to say about it. Um, outside of second life, I think one of the things we've noticed, I think everybody's noticed, a sort of a lack of. Um, well, there's been a, a drop in interest uh, in Second Life uh, for various reasons, which we could talk about maybe if you want to. Um, and outside of Second Life, there are some interesting uh, developments. I don't really know much about the other virtual worlds that a lot of educators are moving to, so that's one thing that I would like to hear from people, as I haven't really had uh, the time or the inclination to to spend to go and uh, explore them but um certainly there are people who are doing things in other game like environments um world of warcraft is one of them and that's been around for a long long time um it's the most popular massively multiplayer uh, online role playing game or morpeg as they're called and there are a lot of people who have been doing uh, work with how you can use that for informal language language learning. Um, that, for me, hasn't been that interesting to pursue uh, until very recently, where because what has changed is that World of Warcraft now is free to play um, up until level 20. So I think that would be something that is definitely worth inter uh, worth um, investigating uh, to see how it could be used for language learning a lot more. And then there's another um, game that has uh, captured the attention of a lot of educators, but so far I don't think it has had much Im um, impact on language education, partly because there isn't sound attached to it. But um, the game is um, Minecraft, and it's Minecraft.com, um, which when you look at it, if you start using it, and it's free to use the most basic version, and then you have to pay a little bit of money to use the, to download the, um, the, um, the more comprehensive uh, software. Um, it looks like a very basic version of Second Life, except everything you do is uh, based on blocks of different materials. So um, there's a block of wood, a block of sand, a block of uh, uh, stone, etc. And you have to actually mine these or dig them out and collect them and then combine different um, different blocks to create things. Um, it's seriously addictive, and it has millions of users, and it's also being used um, certainly by a lot of uh, secondary school and other types of teachers for all sorts of things. You can find a lot if you just go uh, and look for Minecraft teaching uh, online. Um, what's interesting, I think, to compare it with Second Life is that Minecraft is definitely a game. Why is it a game? Well, it works in such a way that uh, the most interesting thing about it is the actual building. And uh, however, during the day, uh, which lasts about 10 minutes, I think, in Minecraft, um, you can go ahead and build and collect things and you'll come across various animals such as sheep and cows and then at night which lasts another 10 uh, minutes uh, there are some uh, monsters zombies etc that come out from the hills or wherever or come out from the dark deep underground and attack you um, so the game element is uh, survival uh, has a survival aspect to it but you can really ignore this game element by just uh, building yourself shelter and keep keeping out the uh, the monsters, if you like. So you can live 
indoors most of the time, certainly during the night, and avoid the monsters and go ahead and build. But there is this uh, element of survival which is still there in the uh, background, which um, is interesting. Um, so those are the two big immersive environment games, I think, of interest for me as far as education is concerned. And uh, the other thing is what we're talking, what we've uh, written about in our book, Digital Play, which, uh, as Dennis said, is coming out in September. It's being published um, principally with language teachers in mind, uh, specifically English language teachers, but applicable to any teachers of any language. Um, and there we've used online games, so free online games is the main focus, and we've tried to uh, show that uh, teachers can uh, take advantage of those, either just talking about games or using them in the classroom, whether you, they have uh, access to one computer or several computers, as in a class set of laptops or netbooks or a computer room. And we've tried to give lots of different example activities as well as uh, an argument uh, for what you can do and why you should uh, use games. I want to stop there and uh, and actually ask people uh, here to introduce themselves, perhaps, and also to say um, what relationship they have with uh, immersive environments apart from, well, sec Second Life and outside of Second Life because um, I can see some things in the uh, chat room as well about RuneScape, etc. So let's hear from everybody else, I think. Okay, um, so could you tell us what you do in Skype, Lynn? Uh, yeah, I set up groups for people to communicate with each other and I also offer support um, for people who are on time uh, within certain set hours purely for English learning, um, and not so much teaching, but helping them to learn and get over some of the hang-ups they have about actually talking. <laughs> that sounds interesting. Are, the, are, they te are they students that you actually teach as well, or do you, you only have access, uh, sorry, contact with them online? Well, they used to be. That's how it started. Um, but then I realised there's a lot of people out there who need that kind of help. And um, so I run it purely for people. I think there's about two people now who I help, who I've, I actually know personally and have taught. Uh, the rest really are from all over the world. Um, and, yeah, they come to me through my website. And I don't turn anyone away, basically. <laughs> That sounds great, yeah. What about in Second Life? Do you teach the same people in Second Life or is that a different group of Yes, I'm, I'm trying to encourage people uh, to come into Second Life Papa? because of the Maybe voice chat like now. That. Hello. <laughs> Who's that? Sorry, um, that's my granddaughter. Let me figure out how to mute this. No. Hello. Oh, ahead. you can't mute Carry her. On. You can't mute her. <laughs> No, basically, um, I'm, I'm encouraging people to come into Second Life and experience it, either with me or in other language areas. Um, very nicely, Graham's put together a, a whole list of places you can go on Second Life. I've just linked to it today, um, because what I want to do is just encourage people to use this technology, not necessarily be completely... Um, addicted to what I do, um, but sometimes they, they don't have the confidence to go out there on their own. And so, yes, I do offer certain things in Second Life. I'm doing some role playing at the moment, which is what brought me here um, from Jane Eyre and uh, using the Vertlantis holodecks. Uh, we're doing some scenes from Jane Eyre, in, complete with costumes and me dressed as a bloke. Not ideal, but strangely, <laughs> men are more, are more reluctant than women to actually interact in Second Life. I'm not sure why, but uh, maybe a psychologist here might be able to tell me. So, oh, really? Yeah, that's me. That's interesting. Um, what the tell, tell us more about the Jane Eyre stuff? Is that um, is that something you, you're doing for fun, or is it something that you're putting together to? All and as well as for fun, of course, to uh, to create uh, a record of it in some way, a video or whatever, or is it just for the 
fun of doing that? Well, one? what it started as is um, as a book club, uh, which we were running on Skype, and then we decided to move to Second Life, just reading Jane Eyre from cover to cover. And after we'd finished it, a couple of people were reluctant to give up, and so I decided to do some scenes, not the whole book. Uh, and yes, we are going to record it, but at the moment we're in rehearsal stages. Uh, <laughs> It's good fun. It's got to be fun because I do it for free. So if I'm not enjoying it, it's a bit too much like work for me. So, um, yes, we're, ha we're doing it for fun with a slight emphasis on uh, learning and learning how to use Second Life uh, in a creative way as well. So um, everybody's had to get their own costumes and learn their lines. Well read their lines at least from a Google document um, yeah. and learning to emote and use gestures. So it's actually part learning, part fun, part English related because let's face it, it's Jane Eyre. Um, so. That sounds like a, a, a great way. I mean, I think that, that's it. Um, you know, getting it. I mean, through doing that, as you say, you, you, I guess a lot of people are going to pick up a lot of uh, advanced second life skills from, from doing that as well. Well, we made a rug. <laughs> but then I found the, the, the <laughs> library in the holodeck, and I'm afraid there's nothing I could build that could um, remotely compete with that. And when I brought the, um, the actresses in, they were so blown away by it, it kind of made them even more, even keener to actually take part. And a couple of people have turned up to watch uh, but they're all a bit shy still, um, even though nobody ever sort of, you know, it's a very safe environment, but um, it's it's that level of shyness um, at the moment. But a couple of people are, are just really keen, and so they're willing to trip over the furniture and um, turn themselves into little Jane Eyres. <laughs> it's great. I love it. Excellent. Sounds great. I've got, there's a question in the... Um in the chat from Heike about emoting, it said, uh, what is emoting and how can you learn to emote? Well, it's doing more than just speaking. I mean, when we were reading the book, um, I tried to sort of get people to try and put emotion into what they were reading rather than word for word. And this is even better because you can also, we've been discussing movements and gestures and a couple of people have really got into it and they've been looking for um, gestures that involve stamping your feet, yeah? Um, and sort of movements. Um, I've been using my frown a lot because I'm Mr. Brocklehurst. I don't know if you know Jane Eyre, but he's not a nice person. And yeah. <laughs> so basically showing what you think the actor or the character through gestures and through uh, facial expressions it's quite difficult because sometimes you're doing several you know, speaking trying to use a gesture uh, and it all goes terribly wrong and you end up embedded in a sofa and stuff like that but as long as it's done lightheartedly that doesn't matter <laughs> okay yeah no, that's like great. looking at lynn's hat and shaking her head hey i love my hat <laughs> <laughs> could you um could you give us a little bit now that the um I know Jeff Lebo is is streaming at the moment, and so we've got your um okay, would you like me to get into character? Oh yes, please, okay, hang on then oh I've got to this is where I show my terrible skills at finding my way around Second Life. Where is he? He's here somewhere. Mr. Brocklehurst. Uh -huh. Jane Eyre. Okay, so replace current outfit. And this is where sort of the role playing can come unstuck because, you know, people don't mind playing their own sex but they do kind of sometimes bowl cat oh i'm in me on these um sort of changing sex so i've had to sort of become the man so <laughs> <laughs> so this is my mr brocklehurst 
And at one point, of course, he's talking to Jane Eyre. So I have to try and, um, who can I borrow? I'll borrow Gwen. Hello, Gwen. <laughs> I'm coming the for very, you. Very nice avatar, by the way. <laughs> oh, it was a freebie. Um, it was, and I, then I found the top hat and the t coattails and all that stuff. So it's all free. Hello, Mr. Rocklehurst, indeed. So what I do is I go to the gesture. Um, now it's frown, I think. This is, again, I have to get myself ready normally of a morning. Let me find my gestures. Hang on. And as I'm speaking to her, I say things like, um, and how do we avoid going to hell, Jane Eyre? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> one more time, one more time. For those who missed it. And how do we avoid going to hell, Jane Eyre? I have been told it's quite scary, and <laughs> the, the person who plays Jane Eyre ran away from me the first time I did it, so... <laughs> Are you scared, hiker? Well, I, still, I was hoping for the gesturing class yesterday, and it was cancelled, because what I'm hoping to do is overcome this. When you're speaking, it sometimes interferes with the gesture. And, um, yeah, yeah I'm, as I, I'm only a few months old, you know, so I'm still learning. Oh, it's very good for being a few months old. Definitely. OK, well, thank you very much. I'm going to change Lynn. back to a woman now, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, um, Karelia, would you like to take the mic and let everyone know uh, the kind of things that you, you do, because I know you do a lot of things in Second Life and outside. Um, hello, Graham. Well, I've had quite a lot of things done to me as a, as a learner. I've used Second Life. And uh, oh, I was so enjoying just hearing the, the sorts of things that Lynn has been doing with her class. And really, that's what I experienced for a couple of years with um, Anna Begonia teaching Italian or facilitating learning Italian. Um, and there we did a similar sort of thing in that we were, um, well, one of the activities was to prepare a film, prepare for a machinima, where it involved lots of preparation. And what you were talking about, Lynn, there, the fact that you were given cards which you had to learn to pronounce the words properly. And then that was put together into a film where, yes, we found it was challenging using the emoticons and um, gestures. Um, but it was fun. And in the end, I suppose you think, well, what, what was the purpose of the activity? And uh, certainly I felt the purpose was to make us into a community of learners who enjoyed each other's company. So we were, would keep meeting up regularly. Um, and also it made us perform. So whatever the quality of the outcome, I actually think the outcome, the quality of what um, Anna produced in her machine was, was, was good. But in the end, that, that wasn't the most important thing. I mean, I know it's often said anyway, that really was the process which was more important than the actual outcome. So that's my own personal experience in Second Life, is what drove me to think, well, how can I perhaps promote this in my own teaching? I teach in a, an 11 to 18 school. And what I do now is I use it really in three ways. One way is that I will project my screen to my class of learners and the yep. the learners can watch me interacting with people in Second Life. Um, and that can be either a role play situation. So, for example, I'll go to Arcachon in France, the sim, and I will have prepared um, going to the shops role play. Um, or it can be conversation. So, you know, a couple of weeks ago, July the 14th, uh, one of our good friends, Dev, Dev Link Garside, he was off work, he wasn't working, and he was prepared to sit at his computer and be the French native speaker who talked with my students, who asked him about, well, what was it? What was the um, Fête Nationale? And we ended up visiting the Sims together, Arcachon and the Paris 1900 Sim, and the class were absolutely delighted when he pushed me off the top of the Eiffel Tower. 
So that really just generated a lot of interest from the, from the students. And, you know, these days you don't necessarily get native speakers in your classroom, um, especially with the cuts there are in money. I think this is going to be a, could be a really good way of native speakers in your classroom. And then the third way is that I have got some land within Scalabrate, which I'm developing the, with an aim to having a place where 13 to 15 year olds can come in and experience a 3D virtual world um, and learn languages. And so far what I've got up to is I have a Second Life Club every Thursday evening. I've got some keen students who are there um, who help, who are helping and who are leading me actually in building and putting together um, activities. We're not actually using languages to be honest, we're just having a good, having good fun. But you mentioned Graham about Minecraft. And I found that the stu one student in particular has learnt so many skills through Minecraft that he's picked up how to use Second Life mm -hmm. within minutes. It really has not taken very long at all. Oh. But he's demonstrated Minecraft to me, and I'm, yeah, I'm quite interested in thinking mm, how can we exploit this absolute obsession he's got with it, and could we get some sort of language? Because I think you can make it that communities of people can work on a project and um, make yeah. you know make progress together. Yeah, you're right. You're right. There, there are. I think for that you need to have uh, Minecraft running on your own server, or on somebody's server to do it. But then, then there is a possibility, and as well, you could have an an add-on voice application as well if you do that. But it's a little bit complicated, I think, for most people to do. Excellent. Um, yeah, and Helen, you've also been, you've also investigated quite a lot of different games in Second Life, haven't you? Um, could you tell us yes. a little bit about some of the games that you've come across and the ones that you've been most interested in? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, other people have shown me games which, um, through playing normal like board games, Scrabble or um, other games which you would normally play with other people, playing them with a native speaker can be fun. So there are games available in Second Life for, for doing that. I mean, even if you like the game of Endeavour set up um, a parachute game where, um, you know, you put on your parachute, you get on into a capsule, you go up to the top and you try and reach a target. Now, the, you can't obviously see language involved, but you do need language because you're all deciding, well, you know, shall we start now? What, what, um, what height should we go up to? Um, who won, who didn't win, or you were close emotions. There are all sorts of things just through playing together. Um, uh, you know, you just enjoy it. So there's that engagement and that feeling of community there. Um, I found some standalone uh, language games as well. So on my plot, I've got something called Scrambler, where um, it's an authoring resource. I can put in a whole load, about two thousand, well, as many words as I want to within the contents. Um, and then at a click, it will choose a word, scramble it, it makes it into an anagram and you have to solve it and I suppose you could do that with pen and paper you could do it on the internet but somehow I feel this is more fun that you're standing there with another avatar and you're taking it in turns to be the to, to solve as many as possible within a certain amount of time um, and also you can set it so that there's a, a weekly winner so whoever got the most words solved within a certain amount of time could you could set it up so they get an email home um, I've been quite interested in the Sloodle tools, which um, Fire Centaur has um, has got available. But most recently, the thing which um, some people around this fire have experienced recently is I've just I've found um, a game which is called Lindenwood Squares, which is based on the British celebrity squares or the American Hollywood squares, and it's just a games set. So that really you're reenacting or you're you're um, playing at doing a TV quiz. And I think quizzes are just a fantastic way of practicing whatever you want, that around yeah. the idea of a competition, you can be asking people again and again, what's your name, where do you come from, what do you like, getting people to give emotions. So I think it really does lend itself a lot to, to games in this way. That's great, yeah, no, I'm sorry I couldn't make it. You, you were, did something last night, wasn't it? Well, yes, we did it last Wednesday. We did it um, with an idea, you know, that was for the for teachers. And I feel that 
in a way, the success of it was that at the end of it, people wanted more. And the people who particularly wanted more were learners, because I had invited along some French friends of mine who I know they're often saying to me, oh, we'd like to learn a bit more English. And because it was done in a game format, I think that particularly drew them back. So, yeah, we had about 20, what did you say, Hiker? I think we had about 25 people again last night come along um, for the quiz. I'm not saying that they learnt loads and loads of English, but certainly we seem to have established again at the idea of a community of people um, who it would seem would be prepared to, to come together quite often. Um, I mean, as it turned out, it's quite interesting. I, I, I will, won't go on and on about it because I know I tend to, but um, I was quite interested in the whole fact that you've got the two languages there. That, um, yeah, and that's yes. good then, yes, because you haven't funded me, you're not learning. But in fact, to me, almost, I was quite interested in, in, a, in a concept of whether you could call it buddy learning, that I was there leading the quiz as an English speaker, but I was quite interested to know, well, how do you say all of these things in French? Because some of the phrases I didn't know in French. Um, yeah. So it lent itself to sharing quite a bit about language. Sounds great. I'll, I'll try and make it to the next one you, you do, um, whenever that'll be. And that's generous of you, Webhead, because I was thinking particularly of your, the comment you made. And, you know, I, there was a, a, an Italian person there as well who I think it could be a bit confusing for people if you're hearing English and French. And so I'm quite interested to see, well, you know, is that a model that works? Would it drive away people who don't speak English and French? Um, because I had quite a lot of French speakers there, that's why, I'd, and I teach French, that's why I use quite a lot of French. Um, but it, I think it lends itself. You could, couldn't you? You could have, you know, the, the format of the game was that I would make a statement and they had to say whether it was true or false. And the statement was supported by a picture. And I thought you could make it that you'd show the picture and say to people, well, what do you think the statement is going to be? Um, you could show the picture and say, what do you see? And you could say to people, then we'll write it in your own language. Um, it lends, I, I think there are lots of possibilities. You know, uh, in the in the build up, in the run up, it was uh, suggested that the game was going to be in French. I thought in some of the messages I was reading, so that was my impression. Actually, was that it was that we were supposed to challenge ourselves in French. Uh, but thinking about that too, you could possibly do it in several languages all at one time. There's you know, learning anything if you did it bilingually. I agree. That that's really what interests me. This I think, think. I suppose we've got English as the lingua franca. I think that's helpful to have that as the you know the, the language through which everything else is translated. I I don't know whether it would work any other way. Um, but certainly, I felt at the end of it, I had learned French, even more French. And yes, if you were to encourage the speakers who are learning English to tell you what how to say it in their own language, um, everybody else would learn it at the same time and perhaps draw similarities um, but certainly I suppose I'm trying to think what it was why was it effective in Second Life I mean you could do this couldn't you in Adobe Connect in a room you could do it via Skype I don't know how the rest of you felt but I felt that it worked quite well that you're there feeling that you're a presence with other people and you would got surroundings and you would got chairs to sit on I don't know what anybody else who was there thought yeah, I think I, I think I tend to agree with you. I think the idea of doing things like that in Second Life, the fact that you're in a 3D environment and you can move around and change your point of view with the camera, etc., and sit on things, and it, it makes it far more memorable. I mean, that's one of the greatest things, I think, an environment such as Second Life can add to the uh, mix. And I'm really, it's, oh. it's very good to get your feedback though, Webhead, that you actually learned some French. <laughs> and you're right, awesome. I did originally <laughs> say that I was going to do it in French. Um, but then because quite a few people didn't want to come because they said, well, I don't have French, that's why I changed it. And I thought, well, well because the purpose of it was to, to try out something with other teachers, that's where I, why I decided to keep to English. Ask how long it, how long does it take? create a game set like that uh, you know, I don't or, know how much I, I, I don't know how much to confess to really <laughs> the um, the set didn't take any time because um, Jeff Beckenbauer very very uh, generously 
gave it to me. And in fact, he is now making it into um, a holodeck, into a case, a crate, so that we'll all be able to use it. Um, it took a long time thinking out the sequence. Um, what I did, I watched um, and transcribed a program from YouTube of the game itself so that I had exactly the order and exactly the catchphrases. Um, so that takes a while, doesn't it, doing the transcription. Um, but then what I did was to um, write out the sequence, so really phrase by phrase what would be said. And because there is so much repetition, I really could, having got it right, I, it was a question of copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste um, for each of the questions. So it has taken me a long time to set it up, but I think now I've got it in a format that for any of you, I could just give it to you as a Word document. All you would have to do would be to change the question and whether or not it's true and false, and, you've, and it's already done for you. The thing which took me probably about a couple of hours was that I decided to go, if you like, the extra mile. I'd got my questions, I'd got whether they were true or false, but then I thought, it would be really good to have a visual stimulus. And in the real game, they don't have that. But I put together PowerPoint slides. And for each of the statements I made, I got pictures from the internet. Just really, it was, that was quick to do on Google. Google's wonderful, isn't it? And I put the pictures together. And the idea was that that just gave a focus for people and also um, something which you could exploit for lots of other reasons. So I thought, you could do it as a pre-question. It could be that predictive exercise. There are the pictures. What do you think my statement is going to be? Um, or at a basic level, what, what are these words? Do you know that it's English? But what I was thinking of doing in the next time I do the game is I will show the pictures people have already seen and say to them, can you remember what the statement was? And can you remember whether they were true or false? Um, I mean, I've been told by my French friends that following these games, they've all been talking about them afterwards. Um, Cathy said to me, you know, that's kept us going for a week, deciding whether or not it's really true that dogs uh, don't have a, um, are colour blind, or that cats don't, no, that, what was it? I'm trying to think, that cats don't, oh yes, cats have a sense of smell, but some people are saying cats haven't got a sense of smell, so they really are still talking about it. <laughs> yes, Jens, I think... It, somebody else made the comment that actually it took a long time in the first session to tell people how to play the game. But when you watch TV programs, what do they do there? They often, don't they, they, they very, very quickly at the beginning of every game tell you how to play it. But they assume that people know the rules. They don't go into all of the rules every time. And I think that's, if we, you know, here in Second Life, if we, we, if we establish that as a sort of game we play, eventually you wouldn't have to spend so long explaining about it. Can I just say that here in North Germany, we're still discussing uh, whether dogs are colorblind or not. And by the way, I seem to be called Vlad's name. I'm really Osner Kantab, whose first um, PC crashed, and I came back on the second machine as a second person. It was a great game. Lovely. Welcome back, Dennis. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, that's great, Helen. Um, just going to um, ask uh, Jens, perhaps you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about more of your experience in and outside, outside of Second Life with games, etc. Um, well, I'm a bit of a, of a newbie around. Well, I'm a part uh, of the Avatar Project, um, uh, which is um, a project started here in the beginning of January lasting for about five months. We finished it here the 17th of May. Uh, it consisted of about uh, five European countries, um, Austria, uh, Bulgaria, um, Spain, Italy, Denmark. Um, yes. Um, it was a course designed to introduce Second Life for teachers. We uh, were introduced to tours, uh, lectures, uh, tours, and um, games, how we could use it in our teaching. Now, I'm a language teacher myself, teaching English, um, but at the course, it was a general course for all types of teachers, math, science, etc. Um, and for me, it was a new world. Um, to discover a new world for me. Um, I've been doing e-tweening 
for many years with small films, sending them to my colleagues in Belgium. Um, but it was a bit boring for the students that they were not able to do uh, direct communication um, in real time. Um, and uh, for me, uh, this had been a new kind of teacher's education, um, this project and uh, experience, for instance, the, the Avalon people, um, which I met at the World Best uh, Practice uh, Conference, which was a completely eye-opener for me to a new world um, for days and nights, and um, there I met uh, Gwen. And, and the group, uh, which were uh, which inspired me a lot, um, but uh, we had to do like a kind of apprenticeship here. We had to do a project with our students, uh, my student in my class, um, and but it was very difficult to find um, colleagues in the other countries because it was the end of the teaching season. Well teaching year, so we had focus at the same time at our uh, exams. Now the reason why we started here the 17th of January were this new possibilities that our students um, who are um, 16 years old, they were allowed to come into second life, uh, which gave us the possibilities and so we, we, couldn't, we couldn't wait. Um, um, but uh, my project, um, um, about a bit about my project was that we um, wanted to, to make a kind of collaborative uh, work uh, in, in uh, teaching English with uh, well, my, my students and, and, and another class from, from another country. But that wasn't possible uh, because of the timing. And that was actually a general problem for the whole project, but that's another story. But uh, then I, I um, decided uh, to do uh, some of the things at the British Council, uh, which were quite uh, fascinating. Um, but uh, we have we had some problems uh, with the, with the, with the Sherwood Forest because uh, there were two islands. There was actually, I think. It had to do with the uh, ten grants, it's called. So we had problems with. Uh, I spent some, spent a lot of time figuring out how to, how the rotten was get open. I had made an um, evaluation, yeah. which yeah. could be seen. So for me, uh, it is um, uh, very interesting to 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 listen and to learn. Um, uh, yes. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thanks, Jen. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Jens. Um, yeah, you're right about yeah, the right British about Council. The we found out um, we, the islands that we the have now were transferred, were transferred from, from the teen grid, the and uh, everything worked fine there. there. And then transferring, transferring them did something, so some of the scripts, etc., stopped working stopped as expected. So it's taking us a lot longer than we thought to get it all working again which is a shame we've also had the situation that we're not really sure because it was designed for teens whether we should keep the content as it is or change it so it's all pretty much up in the air and we haven't really come to a definite decision yet either anyway but um, sorry could I just say it's it's a wonderful place uh, all all the quests um, all the activities, um, but we, we would like to, uh, I mean, state if, if one could be more introduced to it, we had, we had a lot of problems with, with, with that, and, and we see great potential in, in all the quiz. But how to, we saw also a bit of films and so on, but the, the main thing is, uh, where could one get some more information about it and, and a bit of teacher's help, uh, maybe be, maybe get some to do a bit of introduction to, to uh, okay. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, that's a very good point. Um, I'll uh, have a bit of a think about that. Thanks for the feedback. 
Um, Mino, do you want to take the mic, or are you too busy? Sure, I can try. If you're not breaking something, you're not trying hard enough. Uh, <laughs> I'm Mino Rich, Jeff Lebo in real life, and I got into Second Life pretty early on in 2006, primary interest being webcasting and being able to stream all this stuff that was happening in world to people who were not able to get in world. And we set up webcastatoriums. I never really used it for language learning um, back then. And these days I'm back in Korea and I'm working in a teacher training program. And one of my colleagues was very interested in Second Life and so developed a course for our program. And frankly, it hasn't been very successful. A lot of the uh, teachers, and these are elementary and secondary school teachers, meet Second Life and say, A, there's no way we're going to be able to use this in our teaching, and B, it's a seven-week session, and Second Life has a bit of a learning curve, so it hasn't been successful in that sense. And, you know, I've heard, you know, people pulling out and a little bit, it's lost some of its uh, shimmer, but at the same time, I'm very excited to be getting back in and seeing what's going on. Yeah, I think, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, you're very right there. I think there's, um, it's, it has a very steep learning curve, which puts a lot, a lot of people off. And uh, I think it's very good for, in some, in some contexts, but for um, a lot of what we expected would happen, uh, hasn't happened. I think a lot of us who were around in, in the times when you were starting as well, we were very excited about how it would develop and how it would become uh, very easy to use uh, once the initial um, teething problems had been sorted out, etc. And that uh, stage, I think, didn't really appear. I think one thing that I've heard today, I think, is the way Helen's using it with one screen in the classroom and using it to bring native speakers into uh, the class for our students is, a, is an excellent way of using Second Life, which I think I might even uh, steal from you, Helen. I think uh, I'm going to try that out as well, um, definitely. Okay. okay, Gwen, are you um, able to speak at the moment, or are you too busy adobeing or whatever you're doing? I can speak, um, but just have to switch over in Adobe Connect Pro. Um, are you hearing me, guys, in Adobe? Yes, we I can hear you now. Well, to... at least here. I think they should be able uh, Yes, Elizabeth there. So, uh, Elizabeth is in, uh, and Maisie is there. And Maisie is actually here in Second Life with us, so I'm not quite sure why she's in Adobe. But Elizabeth A. So, um, who is that again? Elizabeth Ann. Uh, what's the surname? I can't remember now. <laughs> oh, Jens is showing. Okay, yes, um, I'd be happy to uh, just say five minutes with regards to that subject of gaming and Second Life. Um, generally speaking, I am not experienced in gaming whatsoever. Um, I'm not a not a gamer, I'm not um, also in Second Life. I use Second Life to meet and to converse with people. We've enjoyed the Lindenwood Squares game tremendously that uh, Helen's put up. That was my first sort of experience with that. I'm also not a person who likes quests very much, um, problem solving. I'm not quite, quite sure why it is that I'm a bit an anti-gamer, but maybe I get into it with World of Warcraft opening up. Um, what I have experienced, though, is quite interestingly, um, our neighboring sim just recently, um, they are kind of into what you would call a combating game because they're a military base. And it was fascinating for me to sort of experience how they get together on combating missions and 
again, it was not something that I would, it would really draw me in. Um, so um, I can't say much about this very subject, um, Graham. So if you want to pass on to anybody else, that would be okay for me. Okay, thanks, Hanke. Um, yeah, uh, next in line, Kalyan. Kalyan, do you want to take the mic if you can? Maybe Kalyan's shy. Well, he's not usually shy. Maybe he's not uh, able to speak at the moment. Okay, Vance, how about you? What's your experience of, um, well, let us know about Second Life and outside Second Life games, etc. Yeah, well, I'm Vance Stevens, and Webhead, part of my name is has to do with webheads.info. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm, I mean, I've experienced in Second Life in so far as um, I joined Jeff when he got there at about 2006, uh, mainly because he was going there and I was curious. And since then I've sort of made some studies of Second Life, but I haven't really, uh, I, I can't say I've really done it so much. I'm, I'm quite, I've just learned a few things this week just from some of Heike's sessions. So uh, I'm not one that I can say I'm really doing a lot uh, with the environment, but I'm kind of an active lurker, and I, I like to participate, and I, I, I admire very much what I see other people doing, and um, I'm kind of keen on it just as being a place to meet people who are doing interesting things, and um, I, you know, I, I, I sort of uh, appreciate the, uh, the way the internet uh, interconnects us, and I think everybody here is in the same uh, mind frame, but um, I, I like to explore how those interconnections can be used with students to get them to communicate with one another. And so um, I, I actually, at the moment, I'm teaching computing. I'm not really using these materials uh, with language learners so much, but I'm Probably my next job is going to be with language learners, so I'm probably going to get a little bit more into it. Hopefully, when I get a but anyway, and I'm positioning myself, I think, for when that time comes. And also, um, I really appreciate some of the things I've seen Graham do with um, uh, last year about this time we were in uh, South America, and I was um, um, he was doing a, a, a workshop on games, which I, I thought was really kind of neat. He sort of walked us through some very interesting games, and games that didn't have a lot of language, but of course you could uh, send the students to the cheats, and you could um, and get the students to talk about the language that was going on in the games. And it, it sort of, um, as we were talking about earlier, I think there is quite a lot of meta-language associated with Second Life, uh, just figuring out how to do things, and also some of these possibilities of using uh, dual languages. Um, you know, there's so many possibilities uh, that, that people can't help learning. I, I really liked running around uh, Language Lab, for example, and be the reporter there and uh, going into the coffee shop and just talking with whoever happened by. I think these are excellent language learning opportunities. I, 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 there I met people who had bought into the courses and it, appreciated talking to me whom they happened to meet there. and uh, Just kind of um, all kinds of ways that I think people can learn language in the correct way, maybe in kind of a dogme way. I think there's a lot of dogme here. Thank you. Thank you, Vance. That's great. That's uh, a great link to uh, ask Dennis to to uh, speak about his interests in Second Life, because I know, D Dennis, you're a great uh, dogme um, promoter in the use of Second Life uh, teaching with in, in a dogme unplugged fashion. Are you able to speak uh, a little bit about yes, that? Uh, and, uh... Thanks, Graham. I, I hope um, that I can be heard. I'm, I'm appearing in the skin of Relesnum, as I explained, but let's skip over that. Um, yes, uh, it's it's pretty exciting for me today because, uh, as a matter of fact, at least um, two uh, people here 
uh, are people who brought me into Second Life, God knows how many years ago. One was Jeff, though it was, um, it was sort of very uh, indirect. Um, I was attending a course of his on um, radio and all that sort of thing. And he happened to mention, um, I think I've spent far too much time in Second Life recently. And, and curious as I am, I thought, Second Life, what's that? I investigated. And then on, on a num number of lists, again, I don't remember which ones, there was somebody called Graham Stanley uh, and somebody else called Gavin Dudeney, who I, I can really find this hard to believe myself at the moment. I was absolutely against Second Life and you know, very could not see how it could possibly be of any real use. And this fellow, Graham Stanley and Gavin Dudeney, um, persuaded me that it was worth looking at. So at least uh, two of you are here today, and, and I've been here ever since. I still love it to bits. Uh, it still frustrates me, but I think that's got a lot to do with my technical skills. Um, I, I always find myself talking about, in, in the terms of language learning, um, Second Life's potentialities, because it's after years, it seems to me that not many people are using it in the way that I, and I think many other people, had hoped they would use it. But but I'm one of those people who think eventually, even if it's on another sim, um, there is so much here, and, and some of you this afternoon uh, have, have shown what you can do here. Somehow it hasn't all come together yet for for whatever reasons. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I, thought, I mean, my God, I went to an old-fashioned grammar school where it was thought if you could play billiards, it meant you should be thrown out of the school because you've been wasting your life. So, so I have my difficulties, but um, I was at this, this game of Linden Squares the other night and, and I found it a fabulous experience. Perhaps it ought to be called, perhaps we should stop using the word language and talk about, I don't know, getting to know people multiculturally and, and then get them playing one of those games. Um, but apart from all of the, uh, the, the technical problems, I, I, I really believe that uh, there is so much that potentially can be done here. And I mean, I'll finish now, this, this uh, meeting this afternoon. Thank you all. I mean, I'm really delighted. And this, to me, is an excellent example of, of a good use that, that you can put to Second Life. Uh, we could be doing it in all sorts of other ways. But sitting here in front of Webhead's uh, headquarters, and, and uh, thanks very much, Gwen and, and Randall, for having, as it were, made it available to the Webheads. It makes all of this sort of possible. I think it's fabulous. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis, for inviting me, and thanks to everybody for coming today, and uh, and again for for Heike, Gwen for making the space available, etc. And uh, I've enjoyed it. I think a couple of things people have said today are are interesting for me. If we can sort of. If I can mention those again, I think Vance just said uh, Second Life is a really interesting way to interconnect with people. And I think one of the things that I think Second Life uh, really does uh, work very well is in that when, it, when it's used in a way like a social network. I mean, I've met people in Second Life. I've come across people who I otherwise would never have come across or I certainly wouldn't have... Uh, found out what they were doing so much i think that's definite uh through various activities that have been going on through the years and then the other thing is the i think what what you what was said uh, by a few people today i think uh is important the uh the fact that the visual aspect of things makes it more memorable i think definitely don't know if anybody else has anything to say about that or about what Dennis was saying about how Second Life really hasn't lived up to its potential. Do you feel it has? Do you feel it's going to? Or do you feel that this is something that's just going to continue for forever, that it's it, it's not going to realise its full potential? I'm curious how you Second Life insiders feel about Open Sim. Does that have much of the appeal of Second Life for you with 
fewer of the commercial implications? Are there features that are missing? What's your take on OpenSim? Um, May I? Uh, yeah. Pick up? Oh no, go ahead. You, I'm sorry. No, but then I have to I switch just, over again. It always takes a little while to switch you go over. Ahead. You go ahead if you've switched over. Go ahead, Heike. Okay, I'll switch big, quickly back to Graham then. Um, in uh, three minutes, just would like to sort of mention the uh, potential of Second Life versus OpenSim. OpenSim is still, um, well, there's one one big big difference between Second Life and OpenSim. It, um, there's no such thing as a marketplace, which means that everything in OpenSim that you would like to have you have to build again from scratch. Um, the, uh, uh, you can get freebies amongst each other. Um, the other thing is voice over IP is still not developed. And frankly speaking, OpenSim is at the stage of where Second Life was about three years ago. So uh, give it another three years, OpenSim will be a fantastic resource for um, uh, educators. Um, I believe though that Within that time, I think three to five years, given three to five years, I, I foresee another world that will actually take us very much by surprise, every one of us. And uh, I believe that the world after Second Life will be uh, Google Earth. Google Earth and the 3D buildings that currently are already placed on the, what's the satellite image of the Earth itself. Um, these three bit three D buildings are created with Google SketchUp. Um, it is uh, done by people. Uh, it's crowdsourced, so called. You will find Google Earth, not Google Life. Google Earth is, which is the software. It's the satellite image of Google, uh, of of the. Earth. Um, and uh, Google Earth has now, if you look at various cities, uh, Tokyo, New York, uh, Paris, etc. Almost all of the major cities, town centers have been rebuilt already in complete 3D. These buildings are still shells. There's nothing inside and you cannot walk inside. But we will be seeing, sooner or later, we will be seeing our own avatars walking these real 3D <laughs> streets on real Google Earth in 3D. And I believe that it will be a matter of uh, where are we going to do our meeting in New York or Tokyo? Well, send me the link <laughs> to the map sort of thing. Yeah, I believe we will be seeing that in about, I don't know, three to five years time. Over to you, Graham. Very interesting prediction, uh, Heike. I think uh, you might be uh, right about that. I think the thing, I'd miss from that though is uh, the kind of fantastical elements of Second Life. Um, how would Google Earth be able to replace that, the kind of uh, places that don't exist in real life that exist in Second Life, which I think Second Life is very good at doing that, of uh, providing a kind of fantasy environment. Maybe something will be uh, done about that. Jens. Just to carry on a bit uh, more what uh, Gwen was talking about, um, it, about the, the possibilities with the real life and, and the 3D possibilities with um, Google Earth. Well, um, it is quite fantastic in the technical way that I can sit here in Denmark with my laptop, wireless, and be uh, connected with you people. Um, and it's stable, well, stable so far, but it's quite a achievement. Well, the, the basic problem in, in our schools, well, I think also in some other places, is that the, that, um, the computers and, and, and the net speed is, is not okay. But it's a matter of time that, um, that uh, they are getting more stable and we can do things uh, like like this, because in teaching things must be working. They cannot accept. We cannot accept crashes and so on and so. On. But um, it's a way ahead with uh, new computers and, and high speed internet. Yeah, it's just that I find it 
I do think this is an interesting thing, and it's one that's discussed quite a lot of people by quite a lot of people. Um, and I think when you're dealing with teenagers, sometimes teenagers actually don't want to necessarily have their faces on the internet, or to you know sometimes you'll point a, a camera at them and they and they don't want to be seen. Um, and I think one thing that we tend to use in languages is the use of puppets, and even with six formers to give them a puppet or to give them a fa literally a mask to put over their face. Suddenly they will do different things. And I've, I mean, I was just delighted to see the other day in our courtyard some six formers um, preparing to do it. They were preparing a play which they're going to go and perform at the primary school in French and another lot in German. And the students who I haven't seen being terribly animated before, give them a, a, a mask and they'll do it. And that's where I feel, you know, possibly that's um, a way that you can exploit avatars. That if anything, for some people, not for everybody, we're all different, but for some people, having an avatar might mean that they will come more out, out of themselves. And an example from my own experience is that this person who, who, who my students see, um, will see her avatar, I mean, she's, uh, you know, possibly a little bit older than I am, but as far as they're concerned, when they see the avatar, she's quite, um, well, like I am now, you're quite young looking. And um, I'm not saying that they wouldn't want to speak to an older person, but sometimes it can help that you've got an avatar there and engage the interest a little bit more, perhaps. <laughs> As several people have said, this is a definitely um, personal preferences here. I was just reflecting that right now and, and this afternoon, I don't think I'm paying much attention. I hope I'm not going to hurt anybody's feelings. Not paying much attention to what any of you look like. I'm listening to what you say. And that uh, there's a whole range of possibilities here, isn't there? I know some people love, um, you know, be it a puppet. Kids love talking through puppets. Some people... Uh, can be more open um, if if they're wearing a different face, and some people prefer to look. But the fact that all of the look roughly the same or different, the fact that there's this great range of possibilities is one of the very good things about Second Life, I would think. Yeah, I totally agree. I think um, I think I'm. I've not thought about using puppets with uh, teenagers, certainly with younger learners, I've used them and they work really well. But uh, it's another good idea for me to try from Helen, thank you. Um, okay, I think uh, um, what you said about the way that people look as well, I'm not sure, sometimes it doesn't make much difference. I think doing the kind of thing we're doing today, Dennis, I don't think it makes much, much of a of a difference um it does add a for me meeting around the campfire and seeing you all and uh, uh changing the camera from time to time uh does have the effect that i'll probably remember this a lot more than i would if it was just on skype or even if you were just watching a sort of uh, a chat room with even our fo with our real life um, images being displayed from webcams um, so the visual element does add a lot for me, which is why I keep coming back here, I think. And I suppose things like uh, what Lynn was saying, you know, when, when you get into role playing, then it, much, it must really help getting into character when you change your avatar, etc. Yeah, Graham, I just thought when you made that remark uh, about us, um, I suddenly thought if there was a sort of black and white film of us, uh, our real earthbound selves having the conversation we've been having this afternoon. I don't think it would be very exciting visually. But, but yeah, I love this. Uh, as I sit here, of course, like, as if I'm on a balcony, and, you know, with palm trees and this funny bit of the end of the um, building here. And uh, I've, I'm pretty sure I've become visually much more switched on in real life since I've been frequenting Second Life. It's another plus. I so yeah, agree it's funny. with you there, Dennis. I really do. The number of times I'm <laughs> should I confess this, that, you know, I'm walking around real life and I, I mean, just most recently, I went and um, came to Barcelona with um, 
with uh, my friend from Second Life. I mean, that's another story. But we were going up an escalator at one point in the airport, and we both looked at each other. And I said, it is, isn't it? It's just like the city of Mexico in Second Life. <laughs> and it really was a case of rec real life imitating Second Life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a funny, funny thing to think that. I think when I first started uh, using Second Life as well, I used to walk around with uh, my colleague Kyle and we used to estimate the number of prims that certain things in real life we'd come across would take to build in Second Life, which was a little bit sad, I think. <laughs> Heather, I think um, your question about the teenage grid now the British Council doesn't have any uh, thing for teenagers the teen grid is has pretty much disappeared although there are some um, there are some spaces which are still available for teenagers isn't that right Helen you, you're involved in school Elaborate, which is still open to teenagers yes um, school Elaborate have come up with an arrangement with Linden labs which means that they have still got um, private land it's now been limited to 13 to 15 year olds because the 16 year olds allowed are allowed in the main grid but i think they are making arrangements so that people can still stay there um, and the big difference that well, the different massive difference it's made to me and it's given me a more of an impetus to do something is that now we can more easily get things from marketplace into teen grid before part of the problem was feeling that you're having to start from scratch and that going to echo what like we're saying about open sim, you know, the idea of going somewhere where you have to start from scratch, I really wouldn't necessarily have time to do that. But, um, okay, Lynn, you're saying you wouldn't let kids on SL. I understand, but I mean, kids are, they are all over the place. They are on the internet. Um, the, within Scalabrate, it's extremely safe. It really is, in that um, the only adults who are allowed there are people who've had a very high level of police clearance. And we as adults are responsible for the students th whom we enrol. So really they cannot meet anybody um, whom they should not meet. As far as 16 year olds up are concerned, um, well obviously that's something where you, you can decide. And I, I, I have to say I am thinking very hard about to what extent I do promote Second Life for 16 year olds. But I think they're there anyway. And I feel that, you know, for languages it just is a, almost a no-brainer as a way of being able to meet people and to be able to talk their languages. Um, I had I went along to a session once with somebody talking about having a parents evening where a parent came up and said she was very worried, very worried about her son, her son who was 14 at the time because he was starting to make friends with Germans on Facebook. What should she do about it? Um, you know, this idea of meeting people that he'd never met before. And they just talked about it in a very sort of, I mean, not particularly the Germans, but just, you know, meeting these strange people. And they talk, he, she said, well, look, he's a very sensible, mature sort of person. I wouldn't stop it. I mean, that person, apparently, he's now gone on and he's reading German at Oxford University. For him, it was the way of meeting people and of getting an interest in languages. And certainly in the UK, we really, really need anything we can now to make people interested and motivated to learn languages. Wow, that's... Uh quite something isn't it yeah I think I agree with you totally I'm gonna have to probably make a move soon um, but uh, thanks everyone for turning up I hope I think I've uh, really enjoyed this it's been good I don't usually get to uh, come along on Sundays and and uh, and uh, meet the web heads fans you the web heads meet every Sunday at the same time is that right and the, the idea is to do something different every week related to this learning together do you want to say a little bit about that in case anyone is interested in coming on to the next one yeah sure uh, in fact I appreciate your giving me that opportunity because uh, I kind of like to put in people's recordings, things like the date, which sometimes people forget. Today is the 24th of July, 2011, and we, this is a regular meeting of the Learning Together group. I just put the link in the, in the chat room. This is uh, the link to the 
kind of the schedule. I believe, let's see, next week, I don't think we have anything scheduled. Well, the way it works is that anybody who wants to do a session can just go to the wiki. Uh, you have to join it. And I guess I, I have to know who you are. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll I sort of react in case you're a spammer. I wouldn't just let you write on the wiki. Because it's just a hassle. I mean, I know I can back it up. But, um, but anyway, uh, the idea is that anybody uh, can just write themselves in and set up a uh, schedule. I think I'm trying to get a discussion of the shallows and the narrows. That's uh, um, David Weinberger's characterization of the shallows. He calls it the narrows. But um, anyway, I wanted to get a, uh, maybe we'll have a discussion next week about that. Certainly there will be something. People always volunteer. And then for the week after that, I believe. Uh, it's Heike, Heike again, and uh, with um, some kind of program, uh, there, there's a, a, an advanced scripting. Uh, yeah, Mary Pino is going to uh, be with us. Thank you, Heike. She's going to give a class here, and then the week after that, um, there's something with the Moodle Moot. I'm doing a presentation, which I coincided with this time, and then Heike also is has an entertainment session in the Second Life coming up after that. Maybe if she writes in the text chat. I can mention that, or she can later. But anyway, basically we're here every Sunday at, from noon GMT we gather, and then uh, at 1300 GMT that's when we have these sessions. So this is, right now it's about 1430 GMT. And um, we've been doing this since September. Uh, I try to podcast the ones that are recorded uh, that I can extract an MP3 from. Uh, I podcast them at uh, learningtogether.posterous.com. And um, that's it. And uh, thank you, Graham, for coming along and, and being a, a part of this one, and also for um, moderating the conversation. It was a, a great discussion, I think. Thanks very much. If I could just uh, jump in after that um, and th thank you for that, Vance. Um, I probably slightly confuse people because um, this occasional series, which we had today in front of the uh, Webhead's headquarters, um, by arrangement, invitation really, I slotted in uh, to, to Vance's Learn Together on a Sunday because that seemed a sensible thing to do and one doesn't want too many different series running. Uh, there will be other web heads were also uh, avatars, have avatars, speaking in this occasional series. But um, I'm glad that it, uh, that it fits right into something that goes on very regularly um, uh, with Vance. Um, and I, so I'd just like to say so that uh, Graham and others can go off and do whatever. Thank you tremendously for accepting. Uh, thank you for, for a great session. Um, generating very interesting and useful and, and lively discussion. Um, thanks, of course, uh, Gwen for and Randall for, as I mentioned, for allocating this place as the headquarters and indeed for owning the island on which we sit. Otherwise, we'd have to do it in a boat. And thank you all for coming. Great turnout. Highly enjoyable. So. And last but not least, how could I not mention Kalyan, who may or may not still be with us, but um, Kalyan I met in Second Life too, and then in real life, and it's a good example of, of what positive can happen. Enjoy the rest of the day, everybody. Thank you. Oh, surely you can dance, Graham. Come on. I can't, I've clicked as well, um, Hiker, and it's not working for me. Perhaps I haven't done... What am I doing? Oh, yeah, there we are. Oh, yeah, come on. not working for me. I've you've, got to see my, you've got to see my dragon sometime, though. I've got a wonderful dragon there. Oh, go really on, then. big. It's massive. Do you want to see it? Go have you got then, time? Yeah. Or have you got to... Because yeah. it'll take me about two minutes or so. Okay, That's I'll okay. stop this. Um, I'll stop this, because I am very proud of this. I haven't actually customised it yet. It is just the basic dragon, you understand. Yeah.